You're listening to Coding Blocks, episode 32. Subscribe to us and leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, and more using your favorite podcast app. And visit us at codingblocks.net where you can find show notes, examples, discussion, and more. Send your feedback, questions, and rants to comments at codingblocks.net. Follow us on Twitter at codingblocks or head to www.codingblocks.net and find all our social links at the top of the page. And with that, welcome to Coding Blocks. I'm Alan Underwood. I'm Joe Zach. And I'm Michael Outlaw. This episode is sponsored by WeWet. Save time, money, and pain with responsive cross-browser retina-ready templates that fully integrate into Visual Studio 2012, 2013, and 2015. With templates starting at only $59 with source code, start your next mobile-ready ASP.NET or MVC web application using c or VB.NET in less than a minute. Find yours today at WeWet. That's W-I-W-E-T dot com. The first marketplace for ASP.NET templates. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get some uh, podcast news out of the way. The first is we had a logo design contest that oh my God, that totally was over. not stressful at all. Yeah, it was awesome, <laughs> but man, it took some energy and it almost broke up the band. It was the most painful thing we've ever had to do. It really is. I mean, everybody has different tastes, and that is never more apparent than when you're all trying to decide on one thing. Like here, here's a here's a way. If you want to challenge your friendship with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> try to agree on art. Yeah, just try oh, it. it. It is it is a frustrating thing. And you know what? The the one surprising thing about it, to me at least, was we hired it out so that we wouldn't have to try and come up with anything. Right? Man, do you have to babysit these things? It it, it was a lot of work. Yep. You really need to have a lot of time to dedicate to it. We got so many good submissions, though, but it was just really hard to find one that we could all agree on. But we did, and we're actually really happy with this logo. Oh, you know, and so for anyone that's curious that didn't know, so what we did is we used 99designs uh, to to host this contest. And, yeah, I mean, to, to Alan's point, like, there was every, like, one thing that I wasn't prepared for, and I don't know, maybe you guys were, but every design we had to provide feedback on. Like, this is what I like, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. Or, you know, I think we should go in this direction or in that direction. And it was, it was a full-time job. It, it felt like, yeah, you definitely spent a lot of time on it. And and the thing is, is people spend a lot of time putting this stuff together. So you want to respect what they've done, but at the same time, some things you just don't like, or one of us likes, or, you know, it, it's, it was a challenge to say the least, but I, I really do think we got something pretty sweet out of the deal. So, um, Oh man, the end product is so awesome. I mean, it, it was a painful journey for among the three of us getting there, but where we ended up with, I'm I'm extremely happy with it. Yeah, yeah. We'll be rolling that out to you know iTunes and a few other places, but uh, you'll definitely be able to see it on the show notes for this episode as well. Slash yep. episode thirty two. Absolutely, definitely check it out because uh, we are excited about it. Um, and and so the next piece of news is I was right, outlaw. Do you remember in the last episode I said something about an iPad Pro with a bigger screen coming? And guess what happened. <laughs> Uh, yep. Did I it. did I dog it in the last one? Yeah, you said that's never going to happen. And, and by the way, not only is it an iPad Pro, it has a pencil. <laughs> yeah, that whole you know, oh man, I, I've been accused many times over the years of being an Apple fanboy, and you know, whatever. The difference though is that I think like a fanboy would just agree to everything, but as much as I love a lot of the stuff that company makes, that recent announcement was just disappointing for me but you know hey you know you win some you lose some yep you, you know but for other people they might have loved that announcement it might have been it might have been great but the the whole that whole iPad Pro felt very surface surface pro, pro. <laughs> yeah and, exactly and, and the same price points too you know it's bigger hey there's a a the cover is a keyboard. Whoa. <laughs> and, you know, but it was funny too. It was also comical. Cause like, you know, well, the surface has the, the pen. So the iPad has the pencil and it was like, Oh, come on. Did they like somebody carefully thought it like, we can't call it a pen. Right. Mm. Right. And then it was kind of comical that Microsoft was on stage with them during the keynote to talk about office on the iPad pro. And I'm like, well, I guess at this point they're like, whatever, any device we can be on. 
Yeah, I didn't. I didn't watch the keynote. It, uh, when you guys were kind of shooting me some messages about what was going on, I, I was just happy I didn't waste my time on it. But you know, yeah, this is where this is where people you know get that ammo for the fuel boy or fanboy stuff because uh, like I watch them all, everyone, right, in their entirety. So um, the next piece is again we mentioned last episode that we are now on SoundCloud. So any of you guys who have a SoundCloud subscription and want to listen there. Definitely check it out, share with your friends or whoever else. Uh, and I am slowly updating all the episodes up there. I need to get back to work because we only have the first 12 up, but I will be uploading more. Slacker. I know. <laughs> yeah, and the, uh, the Facebook uh, integration looks pretty cool. So if you follow us on Facebook, you'll be able to see those episodes coming out there, which looks kind of neat once we get that up to date. Uh, also, uh, you know it. Uh, thank you for the reviews. Uh, this time we've got a review from Gunblade77. I don't know if that's a reference to Final Fantasy VIII, but um, I hope that it is. So anyway, thank you, Gunblade77. Yep, it was a fantastic review, too. My boy Singleton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, this was that one. Uh, I, I love that that's become a thing in the show. Yeah. Like the whole singleton meme is like, you know, taken off. Yeah. That's I, I'm just waiting. That someone's going to recognize that one of us and be like, oh, you're the singleton guys. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> no, no, not, not at, at all. all. <laughs> so some hipster developer out there is really upset because, you know, singletons are coming back into the swing. Right. No, we're it's the, an anti -pattern. We're, we're the utility library guys. <laughs> the helper class. Right. The helper class. Uh, all right, so the uh, news was pretty short this, this go around, so let's go ahead and jump into the main topic here, and that is 12-factor applications. Yep, and we're not going to talk about all 12 factors because um, you know we're kind of opinionated people, and uh, we like to talk, so we'll be splitting this up into a couple episodes. Yeah, and there's a lot of meat here. So Yeah, so first let's get into this, uh, you know, a little bit of background on what this is, right? So it's the 12-factor the app. This was a, a how would you describe it? A, an article uh, published by some guys from Heroku, yep. right? Actually, that, a co-founder. Co uh, okay. That uh, they're documenting, like, w you know, the ideal app, right? Like, based off of their experiences, uh, what they've seen works best for an app, and, and that's what they've documented here as the 12-factor app. So we're going to be going through some of these. They've got it broken down into chapters, and each one of these chapters is is short. You know, it's not like a uh, you know Stephen King novel, but um, we're going to be going through a, for a few of them today and see what happens. Yeah, and just to uh, clarify, one of the things that they say on there is that the the goal of this is for writing apps that are software as a service, which is kind of interesting. It, it definitely leans towards that as we get into it, but some of these or a lot of these are things that are probably pretty good practices for writing any type of application. So it, it was an interesting thing that they pointed out that they said the, the end goal is software as a service. But, you know, it, we'll see as we go that a lot of these things apply across the board. Yep. And I was actually kind of thinking about this. Um, in a way, it's kind of like a design pattern for pattern for your product so if you're you know if you're part of a company that's designing some sort of um application that lives either on a you know a server or you know maybe cloud whatever something like that then um, it's kind of like a guideline for how to kind of put those pieces together so there's not going to be anything about like ticketing systems or kanban boards or scrum or anything like that. it's all based around like your product the code the application you know this the stuff that you write all day yeah, and uh, one of the interesting things is we had put out a thing on Twitter a while back saying, hey, is there anything you guys really want to hear about? And Andre actually replied and said he'd like to hear about ALM, so application lifecycle management type stuff. And this is one of the things that kind of feeds into that. So this is... this is Oh, this is right up there with that. Yeah, this has been out for a little while. And, and like I said, it's it's a quick read, and it's got a lot of good good things. So let's go ahead and get into it. Um one of the uh, guiding principles. <laughs> well, hold on. You, you say that, uh, this was been out there for a while. Like, uh, actually, on the site, I didn't even realize how old this is, but it's actually been out there for a few years now. Yeah, I think I saw references to it back to 2010. Yeah, I I heard very recently. Yeah, it seems like it's definitely been making its its. Uh, I've definitely heard more about it here more recently than I did. I didn't hear anything about this 
three, four years ago. Right. So I thought that was kind of interesting. That it seems like it's gaining popularity suddenly. Like its popularity just sprung up. It, it probably got mentioned on a podcast. <laughs> so um, <laughs> w- one of the uh, guiding principles that they have, one of the first things they say is you should use declarative formats for setup automation to minimize the time and the cost for new developers joining the project. Well, before we go too far down this, like, what is declarative? What is a declarative format? And this is something that I wanted to point out for anybody that that is not familiar with this stuff. So when you talk about a declarative format, it's basically something that describes what the app is supposed to do as opposed to how to do it. So when you write code, you'll say, hey, do this part first, do this part second, do this part third. A declarative format is, hey, we want to do this right and it, and so it's a pretty simple thing and so the the opposite side of that is imperative and the imperative is actually what tells you the steps to accomplish the thing and and one of the interesting things i saw in this wikipedia article is there's there's like this bit of gray area because procedural programming in and of itself could almost be considered close to declarative because you can look at the name of the subroutines or the methods or anything there and if it's named well in a, consi- a consistent way, you should be able to kind of tell what it's supposed to do. But it's the actual implementation of those things all put together that becomes your empirical programming. So well, there's two clarifications I want to make here, though. Because <clears throat> one, the declarative format was for setup automation. Yes. That they're referring to. And specifically, these these guidelines were um, you know, what, what a... 12 factor app uh, is you know, like what the methodology is. Right. So one of them is using declarative formats for setup automation. Right. Yeah. And a, a good way to, to explain, it, I think is um, like a PowerShell script is imperative. It's do this, then do that, then do the other thing. And yeah. I was kind of thinking like an, M, uh, like an NPM uh, script, you know, where you're like, uh, or, you know, a, a list of Bower commands, you know? Yes. That would right. be imperative. And the opposite would be like an XML XML file or uh, you know JSON, just a data. You're saying the data would be the declarative, right? Right. So I'm okay. I'm basically defining like this is my version. This is these are the things that I need, and you know you just define that format or define it in that format, and some someone else is responsible for actually going out and fetching that and setting that all up right it's it's basically a human readable approach to it like you can glance at it and kind of tell what's going on so it it was interesting that they said to use that particular like that was one of their key things is you know that's the first part of it so the next thing is is you have to have a clean contract with the underlying operating system offering maximum portability between execution environments We'll get into that deeper as we go. They have to be suitable for deployment on modern cloud platforms, obviating the need for servers and systems administration. Now, this kind of goes back to the whole software as a service type thing, right? Um, That's probably one of the reasons why they state that. It's not a bad idea to write any application that way anyways, um, because if you make it to where it's flexible enough to be moved on to, you know, different type of environments, then then that kind of takes care of itself. Yeah, and if you're writing the next version of Paint, then a lot of this stuff doesn't really make sense for you. But uh, if you're doing any sort of like kind of modern web app development, then this is right up your alley. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I mean, I would agree that, I would say that some of these uh, factors still apply regardless of the type of application that you're going to build, though. I mean, we'll, we'll get into some of these, but you know, some of these are just like how to structure the code you know, necessarily. Right, yeah, but right? like that doesn't matter what the app, the end app is. Right, but but you're not going to try and put put paint on a cloud platform, right? Like to to Joe's point, like that's going to be very much specific to an OS, right? No, but here was one of the things that I guess where I'm going at with this though is that like these twelve factors, like these guidelines, these introductory guidelines that you're you're referencing, right? They mention the cloud platforms, but actually the twelve factors themselves, there's there's no no one part of the 12 factors that are dependent on cloud, right? Like, and that's what I'm saying. Like these factors could apply to any type of app that doesn't, it could be, you know, an iOS app or, you know, the next MS paint app or whatever, you know? Yeah. And for your app, you could probably go through this checklist and say, 
yes, yes, no, not applicable, you know, for the things that maybe don't make sense to your specific product. Yeah, I, I guess like um, to your point on that, the the one thing that where that doesn't apply, though, and I think this is why the whole cloud thing comes into play is when they start talking about scaling out. Uh, and that that gets further down into the actual, you know. Yeah, one but of the I mean, if you're factors. just creating an MS Paint app, then that scaling app, then that's doesn't you know, matter. A point, right? Because it's like, well, every install can can scale, so it's like, you you know, you understand what I'm saying? So yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why like this whole thing being able. I mean, to it's go cloud. cloud. It, it, they mentioned cloud because it was Heroku, but it's not not like the factors. I think are more abstract than just cloud. Is my point. So yeah. I don't want to turn anyone off to it and say like, oh, well, I'm not doing cloud. Right. I'm not doing cloud development. So none of this is going to imply because my point is actually the opposite. I, I this still all of this still applies regardless of the type of app. Yep, and I think um, even if you're starting small and just living on one server, if you follow these guidelines, you're going to be ready to take that to like a multi-server environment. You know, because everything is going to be kind of separated nicely and, and modular. Yeah, and that's really the key points of it. And, and they do it all the way across the board. Um, so the next one we have is minimize the divergence between development and production, enabling continuous that. deployment for maximum agility. If you've ever been in a situation where that is not the case, then you know how crazy it is to try and make your applications work. When, when things have diverged too much, like you, you start troubleshooting things that you should never be messing with. So that that is a huge key point. Yep. Yeah, and and <laughs> many times now, it, you know, it seems like more often than not that divergence is data. Oh, always. And and that's the one that I hate the most when it yep. comes to you know the differences between development and production. Yeah. There's been a few times when I worked with products that would work with like server farms or you know SharePoint farms. And uh, I didn't have a good way of mocking that. And so it was just kind of like, I think this is what's going to work. And then you would kind of throw it up in some sort of lab environment to test it. And that feedback cycle is just killer. So It is interesting, Eek. though. I mean, if you think about it, and we all agree, it's very difficult when those things do diverge. So you have a development environment that's not set up similar to your production environment. And it may be a data thing. But then it, it boils down to how do you get data, you know, that that actually mimics that type of stuff, right? Like you can't bring real customer order information or credit card information or any of that kind of stuff down to a development environment, right? So Yeah, you, you need the Netflix chaos monkey. Uh, ah. But for data. Yeah. Exactly. No, but there was another thing though that this one reminded me on too, in uh for any, you know, developers from like you know, old school days of uh you know your your pound defines, right? So like pound debug. Or pound release, uh, you know, type type environments. I don't know if you know either. Of you recall that, but yep. uh, you know, you might have a statement in there to say like, you know, there was a preprocessor uh, uh, declaration to say like, you know, pound if debug. Then you'd have a block of code and pound end if, and if you were running in debug mode, then the compiler would leave that part that code in. And you would see that code get executed, but if uh, you were building the release version of it, then that code got removed from it and never even ended up in it, let alone did it not run. It, it was never even in the final binary. And so right away, you know, this is an older practice, but, you know, right away you had this divergence in your development binaries compared to your uh, release binaries. Yeah, and that could be a big, a huge problem in and of itself. You have something that got left in that you didn't know was supposed to be there. So, yeah, it, I, this is probably one of the hardest things to actually tackle, especially in a development environment where you're making fast moving changes. But um, it, it's definitely a good point. The The next one is can scale up without significant changes to tooling, architecture, or development, or development practices. And Again, one of the cool things about this whole thing is this really applies to just about any programming language, any backing service such as a database or anything like that. Really, these are, I, I think Joe said, or no, I think Outlaw said, this is almost like a pattern, you know, for development. So as long as you follow the principles behind it, then then it can ease some of your challenges as you move along. 
Well, and just to clarify that when you say pattern for development, more like pattern for the development team, right? Yeah. Because like, this, isn't, this isn't like a pattern for the code necessarily as well as like structuring everything, like how the group works. Yeah, you know, back in the day, it used to be enough to just be a front end or back end. And now, you know, there, there's this whole full stack thing going on. And now they're bringing in DevOps. So d- developers are wearing more and more hats. And, and it's kind of because you need to wear more hats because things are getting more complicated and integrated. But I uh, just thought that was kind of interesting. And we're definitely dipping our toes into the DevOps waters here. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, also, I wanted to mention while we're on this kind of the introduction here. Um, I, do you guys ever see uh, Joel's 12 questions? No. Joel Spolsky? Uh, yeah, he used to have um, 12 questions that you could use to kind of um, identify if uh, this, like a company you were interviewing for was a place you wanted to work. And has questions like, do you use, use source control? Can you make a build in one step? Do you make daily builds and so on? Um, so just thought it was kind of interesting that it, this is kind of a, an evolution of that. And uh, the Joel questions, actually, there were 12 of them as well. Are you talking about the the, uh, the Joel test, 12 steps to better code? That's it. Okay. Hmm. Huh. I'll be reading this. Yeah, it's yeah, got other it's... stuff in there, like do programmers have quiet working conditions and stuff. So it's a little bit more geared towards uh, you know a different audience, but it's still interesting. Very cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's an older article, too. Yeah, but it's still these questions. I'm looking over these questions now, and they still seem very relevant. Yeah, Joel is still my hero, <laughs> even though he quit blogging, and I'm sad about it. Uh, I have the books. Do you use source control? No. All right, this interview's over. Right. <laughs> uh, In 2000, though, it, that was you know that wasn't common. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it's come a long ways. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. They are a simple cloud hosting platform built for developers. You can deploy an instance in under a minute. Their lowest price plan starts at under one cent per hour. You heard that right. For seven tenths of a penny for just an hour's utilization, you can have your own instance or droplet as they call it up and running. You pay for the time your droplet is active. Head over to digitalocean.com and use the offer code coding blocks, one word, and get started today. All right, so let's let's go ahead and dive deep into uh, some of these twelve factors. Let's start with the first one, which is chapter one, code base. And this one's right up your alley. So why don't you go ahead and take this one? Yeah, this one's this one's literally like if if you're not using Git, you're doing it wrong. I think that's what the <laughs> takeaway was. No, okay, fine, I joke. It goes a little bit deeper than that, and um, this is something uh, that I've run into everywhere that I've ever used Git. Is um, at what point do you start splitting repos? Yeah, yeah, okay. So fine, I was joking around about that, but it, it was saying that you know it's defining the code base, is tracked in revision control, and that it can have many deploys, right? And that um, you know a code base is a single repository, right? And some uh, centralized you know, system, whether it be subversion, God, or Git, which, you know, would be the preferred way. And, uh, you know, any other set of repos can share a root commit uh, in that repository, like in a Git environment, right? And, uh, you know, what else to say there? That you could have multiple code bases, um, uh, help me out here, guys. Well, so, so what's a code base? You know, if if I've got a website and a mobile app, is that a code base? It's two code bases. So that that was really the the key point is there is a one to one correlation between the code base and an app. A okay. code base does not have multiple apps. That that that's what I was trying to get to. Thank you. The, is that yeah? Because if you had multiple apps sharing same code from that code base, then that is a violation of the 12 factor app. So we right? just put all in one. So code this is, then. this is the point that Joe was making from the beginning no. there about like when to split up their, the code base and individual repos. Right. And as soon as you have some code that's being shared, then that's when that code should be broken out into a separate repository, separate library that could then be shared uh, as, you know, through some kind of a dependency manager, whether it be nougat or, uh, a bower or something like that factory, something, whatever. Yeah. And, and, but you know, a code base is a single app. It's not multiples. And that, that's a very important thing to identify because 
it gets into the next part that we'll get into here in a minute, but it has to be one. If you've gone further, you violated it and it will actually cause you problems down the road. And that's why it's such an important takeaway on this. Yeah. And I think a big part of this, the 12 factor app is, is really just drawing clean lines to things. So if you had like one repo that had your website and your mobile app, then in that repo, there's going to be code that's shared between those two. And so it's not really website. It's not really mobile. It's a shared library. And, you know, what happens is this stuff starts getting out of sync and it just gets real messy. But if you had like clean modules defined and we're bringing this stuff in, yeah, it's more pain to set up, you know, the, the proper packaging, but it does keep those things, you know, nicely modularized and it doesn't let you, you know, cheat those rules of abstraction. It, it goes on too to, to um, talk about deploys yep. as well as that the, the um, you know, there's only one app per code base, but there could be many deploys of the app, right? And, you know, the deploys are different than the code base, right? Right. You know, there's only the one code base, but you could have multiple deploys of that app and each, or, you know, we could even say, you know, since code base equals app, you say many deploys of that code base, but um, any of those deploys could be at a different commit level, right? Right, like you could have a staging environment, a development environment, a production environment, right? The, the, but it's still, um, you know, they're still running the one code base. They came the from app. the same repo, essentially, is what it boils down to, right? So your production one is probably on a stable release. Your your staging one is on the next you know, ready to be released thing, your development environments on your latest development code. So yeah. The, right. My, my development has commits ahead of staging and staging has commits ahead of production. Exactly. But they're all coming from the same route, same repo, same app. Yeah. So I think it's safe to say that if you're logging into a server and changing the files uh, manually, that you are not, you are not participating in a 12 factor app. You've completely violated it at that point. Oh my God. Are you You've saying you do so that? Many rules. <laughs> And back in the day, PHP, ColdFusion ruled the land. It was, you know, it was different times. Oh, dude. I've done things I'm not proud of. Dude, ColdFusion was literally just hack away at the files until you got it to work. And then try to remember to bring it back down, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's a different ballgame. Somebody also put here, importance, non-negotiable. Yeah, so uh, I found an article. We'll have a link to it. And uh, clearly, tech where um, it was kind of written to a slightly different audience than programmers. Um I'm not really sure what the audience is, but uh, I thought that was pretty cool that they put in an actual uh, importance on each step. And uh, so I thought we'd talk about that. And for this one, it was non-negotiable. Like this is a requirement for any sort of professional, you know, working development shop. Oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's about right. I can't imagine like that would be the first thing I did at a new job or, you know, even starting a new project. Like that's like number one for me. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's I mean we've all been in projects where you have this one monolithic type app, right? That really has like 20 different apps rolled into it. And it's really a pain to keep it all managed properly. So yeah, that that's a good one. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. So uh, real quick, I just want to take a moment, you know, we've said this before and uh, you know, I don't mind saying again that, you know, if you've already left us the review, we really, really appreciate it. But if you haven't, we would be forever grateful if you would please take the time. Uh, you can head to codingblocks.net slash review to find quick links to Stitcher or iTunes. Or if there's, if you have some other preferred uh, podcast aggregator that you'd like to leave a review at, we would greatly appreciate it. Leaving those reviews helps uh, you know people to find us. We've all seen how the iTunes algorithm works. And, uh, you know, there's, there's definitely something to be said about, you know, as people, uh, take the time to leave feedback on the episodes, you know, what it can do to the shows, uh, as far as it bumping up in the, uh, in the, in the list there. Yeah. All right. So thank you. Uh, also, uh, let's get on to number two here, which is dependencies. So we chapter talked about two. chapter two. We talked about code base, which is everything that we're kind of working on. We're generating this code base. We are actually making this. Well, dependencies are everything that you don't make. That could be your bootstrap files. That could be third-party libraries. That could be, you know, all sorts of stuff. 
Um, and just for fun, uh, how many package management solutions can you guys name in like 10 seconds? Oh, my God. NPM, <laughs> um, NuGet, Gems. Uh, I don't even remember the I feel ones like from there, the article. There's like some trick that he's going at with this, though. I'm, so I'm wait, waiting for the punchline. Yeah, sorry. I thought you guys were looking at the show notes where I've written a bunch of them. So I, I was trying to set you guys up to sound like super on the ball. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, okay. But the point is that there's a lot of them. And but, uh, this but, has been a big problem, but there are a lot of But you have solutions. like Gulp and Grunt in there, right? Those don't count. Yeah, those are task runners. Yeah, yeah but a lot count. of times those That's task like saying runners... saying that Pearl. Like, <laughs> make sure you're going to count Pearl. A C pan. But Bauer, yeah, C pan fine. Bauer but is not one. Pearl. Yeah, Bauer's one. Yeah, but I feel like a lot of times those are doing those sort of things. They're managing dependencies a lot of times. Maybe that's but, not a. Maybe that's but not you know, fair. one thing that's not mentioned here though that is very soon coming uh, as a dependency is you could also, you know, it's we're getting to the point to where with with services like Docker, right, where we can abstract away the uh, you know the environment as well, right. And that's a dependency too. Yeah, like that, you specify the version of Linux you need, and uh, it just kind of happens somehow. Yeah. So one thing that you said a second ago that that is kind of interesting and somewhat misleading is it's all the stuff that you don't write. It can be stuff you write as well. We just talked about a minute ago. If it's something, that, if it's something that's shared between multiple apps, then it should be a package that gets brought in as a dependency. So it can be your internal stuff, too, that are various libraries that get pulled into multiple different applications. Good point. So um, one of the uh, things that was interesting about this one is it says it never relies on the existence of system-wide packages. Um, I know we've been doing .NET for a while. Can you say goodbye, GAC? I mean... And like, hello, ASP.NET 5. 5, yeah, which is excellent. I mean, you actually, you declare your dependencies. Like, I mean, we've all had issues with GAC, right? Like, you go, you install something, and you're like, why is this not working? Oh, So really? so for those that aren't familiar with it, right, oh, the right. GAC is, is a .NET-specific thing, the global assembly cache. And, and the goal of it was trying to get away from what was commonly referred to as DLL hell, right? Where it was like, okay, well, what version of the DLL do you have that this is trying to load in, and where is it coming from, and things like that. And so the GAC was trying to like centralize that as one repository and make it all nice and simple. But then that became a real problem because then as multiple apps all depended on this one version, and you needed to, maybe for security reasons, you want to not have that version of .NET or any of its assemblies or any of those assemblies available... You know, now it became a big nightmare to, because you were like, well, I don't know which applications are using this thing. Right. Right. So you, you got, you had this mm, basically like a, a global parking lot of stuff that you, it became difficult to know who needed it, why it needed it and managed it versus, you know, take applications on the flip side where everything is, you know, local to their directory tree, for example. Right. So that, that's where ASP.NET 5 is going and, you know, it's pretty much catching up with the way a lot of other platforms already are. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, they went that route to simplify things, right? To to make it easier, and it really ended up causing more problems. Like, you have to bundle everything in order for, which is the new way of doing things, to, to isolate them properly, right? To sandbox those so that you don't have to worry about those external um, variables that, that occur. And, and they tried to make it better but ended up causing way more pains in the long run. Yeah, I think this is um the GAC was envisioned back when uh, people were still on dial up, and so we were re- you know concerned with like downloading DLLs and like if we could just share them somehow, <laughs> we could really cut down on those you know twenty minute downloads. Yeah, I mean it, it it completely. Well, yeah, I mean there is something to be said about you know only ha- you know, instead of having like twenty copies of the same library if you could only have it once, but from a maintenance perspective, it does make it a lot more difficult. So, and that's where, you know, from the 12 factor app is coming from is that, you know, this is something you're going to have to maintain, right? So you want the, you want to know the dependencies and you want them, you don't want to just rely on things magically appearing, right? Yeah. And I mean, a perfect example of this is you have some app that somebody wrote five years ago. You need to put this on a new server somewhere 
you can't get a copy of, you know, Windows Server 2000 or whatever. So how are you going to make it happen, right? Like, and, and with including these dependencies in line in the app, you don't run into those situations. Not as much anyways. So here's a trick question for you. All right. So at the the beginning of this article, right, it starts off, it starts off with saying that you know, this 12-factor methodology could be applied to apps written in any language, right? But if we're saying, though, that you must explicitly declare and isolate your dependencies, right, well, then does that exclude .NET apps? Yeah, .NET, um, it's getting better with the, the new stuff they're doing for ASP.NET 5, but it, it's been frustrating for me before to try and deploy an app somewhere and find out that they don't have, you know, .NET 4.5 installed or something like that. So uh, that's definitely been a, a trouble spot. Yeah, it's it's interesting because that is a problem. I, I also included a link that we'll have in the show notes that is how to bundle things. And there's all kinds of like hints and stuff that you can do so that even if something is in the GAC, you can tell it, hey, I want you to look at my bin directory. Well, okay, so that's where I was kind of going with this, though, yeah. is that because while I've never tried this, I'm – maybe theoretically it's possible, but it sounds like it would be a nightmare to find all of your dependencies. But, you know, the way that works though, is that it'll look first in its executing directory path, right? Before it starts reaching out into the global assembly cache for it. Right. So technically like if you were looking for like something like system.net and you had that DLL side by side your EXE, then it should use that one first. Right. Hopefully. I've never tried that, right. but but then this is where I was getting at is like, well, any references that sy- that system DLL or, um, yeah, that that system DLL wants to make to other parts of the .NET framework, right? Like you're going to have to have all those interdependencies side by side with your app. Yeah, that, that now it big. becomes yeah. yeah, now it becomes a nightmare. Obviously, we're talking like pre-ASP.NET 5 type apps. Which is um, brand new, so... <laughs> Yeah, so right. everything pretty much. Yeah. yeah, pretty much, you know, everything before you heard this. Um but I've never tried that. I've never heard of anyone that's tried that. I mean, maybe with some third-party DLLs, I you know, that's done and I've seen that done and I've done it myself, but nev- never with the sys- the core system right uh, you know, .net DLLs. And that's why I was bringing this up is like, well, you kind of can never do that then. It would right? be difficult. It would be like or it's not practically done. Let's put it that right, way. Right. I've never seen it practically done in a .NET environment that would meet Chapter 2 of the 12-factor app. Well, that that kind of brings me to another question. So they say that you have to use dependency isolation tool to make sure no additional dependencies leak in. Now, that was – so you just asked the question that I was kind of curious about, except for this one. I don't know of a dependency isolation tool for .NET. So the only thing that comes close that I can think of is like MS Build, where it does your build stuff for you. But it, are you guys but aware? But that's not isolation, though. I know. That's the whole thing. That's really just... That, that's just that's just the build the process. Build. And yeah, so that, I, I don't even know what would be the what would be the tool that you would use for .NET. I, I'm not aware of anything. Yeah, I was thinking um, there's that program Depends, which will tell you dependencies of DLLs, but that doesn't help you if you like shell out to something like Image Magic for resizing images, or um, you know, in a Linux environment, if you you know try to if you shell out a wget and uh, whatever install you know whatever you install next doesn't have that particular program installed on it, you know that could be a real problem. And I don't know how to find those. All right, so you've convinced me. I'm full time Ruby and JavaScript from now on. There it is. I'm done. Yep. I'm done. You know what? I can't, I can't, you know, isolate my dependencies. We're done. Does this work for Swift? Can we change the name? Do we have to change? <laughs> are, we're now codingblocks.js. And we're the 11 factor app. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, and one thing we didn't really hammer on, though, but uh, this, uh, a big part of this whole dependency part is actually explicitly declaring them. And there's that word again, declare. So they're talking about having some sort of manifest file or you know, which maybe JSON, maybe XML, maybe YML, whatever, that actually lists all the things that your app needs to run. Yeah. I mean, NuGet has their own file that, that manages that stuff. I mean, a lot of the package managers do, like Bower, NuGet, all those. They, they kind of create the... or 
they handle that manifest for you. So it's nothing that you actually have to do much with other than say, I want this package. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's usually fairly easy, but again, the isolation is kind of what tripped me up is I, I'm not aware of anything for .NET anyways. Yeah. But how annoying is it that you have to have multiple manifest files? Right. Like if you're doing a you know an ASP site, you might have NuGet, you might have uh, Bower, you may have npm in there for some stuff. Yep. Yeah. You know, things are getting complicated. Yeah. So instead of one manifest file, you've got twenty. <laughs> yep. And, and that's realistic now, especially with uh, web development. So, um, yeah. Now one of the cool upticks or the the really nice pieces about this is. If it's done properly, it it would make onboarding new developers pretty easy because, in theory, they'd be able to check out the code base, run the build tools, and all the dependencies would be pulled in. Everything would just be set up, right? Like you mentioned Docker. Like if it was something like that, like it would set up your entire environment and you'd be up and running in no time. I mean, and I know we've tried to help developers in the past try and set up something for for an application that's not well documented or scripted like that. And, you know, it could be a half day trying to get somebody set up. Well, yeah. and this kind of goes back to chapter one, right? Because like in, ultimately deploying the 12 factor app should be simple, right? Right. And so getting a new developer set up is just another deploy. Right. Like, and uh, you know, if you think about it at its most basic level, that's a really good point. Yeah, and that's a, almost a good test to know whether you have your dependencies under control. Is it, you know, how long does it take you to set somebody new up, and uh, how many steps are in your uh, you know deployment to a new environment uh, document? If you're uh, hitting you know dozens of steps, then you probably have a problem. Yeah, but Alan does bring up a good point here. So maybe let, let's put this question out to the audience. You know, if you are using a good isolation tool, dependency isolation, regardless of language. Tweet us, email us, let us know. Yeah, I'd love please. to hear like what tools you're using out there. Yeah, it, it, it was uh, like Googling it didn't bring up much. So uh, hopefully somebody knows. You, you should bing it. <laughs> it. So They just copy Google, right? That's right. Uh, that's duck, duck, duck. <laughs> well, now it's, it's reversing. Actually, Google has been taking on more and more features from Bing. I don't know if you, you guys have noticed. Oh, no. Oh, my God. I'd never Am go to start Bing. getting medals for all my searches? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just making it up. <laughs> all right. So, so where does this one rank in with the, uh, the management then? Dependencies. Uh, the you... article had it as a high. What do you guys think about that? I think dependencies is extremely important. Again, I'm not, I don't know about the isolation, but I definitely agree that breaking your dependencies out so that they can be shared better and, and you actually have an explicit listing is, is very important. So I, I like the way they classified this though, is that they said it's high, but they kind of warn you in, in this, uh, the clearly tech article that Joe was referring to that, uh, you know, without this, you're going to have this constant slow time suck of confusion and frustration, right? Yep. So, you know, yeah, okay, fine. Don't make it mandatory, but it's really in your best interest to make this mandatory, right? Have your dependencies declared and isolated. Yep. And I'm going to put this one, I, you know, it, I, I get why it's high and I think it's really important, of course. But for me, this one's kind of like a medium and that's because depending on your particular setup, you know, if you have a complex setup, but with not a lot of environments, then it may be worth you to worth it for you to take on some of that technical debt, at least in the beginning. I think. Um, well, but it's harder to add in, I guess. Here's why I can support the high, right? And that's a weird statement, but <laughs> <laughs> so my reasoning is is like, have you ever been in an environment where? Um, you know, especially like if you're if you're new to the environment and you're trying to get your environment set up and it's just not building and you can't figure out like why what am I missing and then like hours later after like digging through the code trying to figure it out someone's like oh yeah you got to install this other third party thing and then that makes the magic happen and you're yeah. like wait what like you know whether that be um you know uh, uh, a payment system um you know development you know, in uh, SDK or, uh, you know, some other ma magical tool for, uh, you know, I don't know, like, like the, what's the, the, the data tools for visual studio, oh, you know, yeah. something yeah. like that. Like, you know, 
we've been in those environments, and that sucks because especially like when you first get there, right? Like you're brand new to it, and you're like, okay, man, I can't even like you, you want me to to work on this thing, and and it's it's not even working from the from the start, right? Like I pulled the repository down, and it's already broken. So what am I supposed to do with this? Right. Yeah, I worked uh, somewhere once where it took me a week to get my the product um, building, and I was I was sweating bullets. You know, I was so nervous. I, I I I must be an idiot. I can't get this working. <laughs> and by the time I got it finally working, there were VMs involved and all sorts of weird stuff. And I had my one on one with my manager. It's like, yeah, you know, I'm still iron, you know, getting the kinks worked out. And he's like, oh yeah, it takes everyone at least a week. Yeah, you know, you're good. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> it's like trial by fire. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I feel like that should be one of Joel's uh, twelve questions. What was that? The Florida I, Thunder, baby. I think uh, I think Joe's house just fell on him. <laughs> hey, if it did, I got dibs on the ruby slippers. Hey. <laughs> well, the good news is the rain's going to be done in like five minutes. So yeah, because um, it's Florida, right? It, and then it'll yeah. start up again in about two hours. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, like the wind is probably picking up alligators and throwing them against the house. <laughs> <laughs> yep, got to get aluminum screens to keep those gators out. Oh, that's awesome. And hey, this episode is sponsored by Infragistics. Great apps happen by design. Build your application right from the start with rapid prototyping, UI controls, and the support you need to develop the ultimate experience. Head over to infragistics.com and download your free file today. All right, so let's get into chapter three, which is configs. Configuration, storing your config in the environment. Okay, so what's a what is a config exactly? Is that like my version of .NET? Is that what is that? Well, I would think that versions uh, would be part of your dependencies, right? Like this is more like uh, I'm thinking more th- things like connection strings, yeah, right? Like payment system passwords, you know, things that you'd be tempted to put into like a config file, whether that's some kind of you know, text file, XML file, JSON file, whatever, whatever. It's some kind of, I'm thinking it's some kind of human readable file, right? Okay. Yeah. And, um, also, uh, a, a good way to differentiate between the, um, the dependencies is these are things that could vary by, um, by deployment environment. So a dependency, you know, I need SQL server period. That doesn't matter if that's stage production, whatever, but a configuration, a password is something that, you know, should be different in those environments. Well, yeah, and to, to be more clear on your statement there, though, because according to the way the 12-factor act has is written is that that an app's config is everything that is likely to vary between deploys. Okay. Right? Yep. And so credentials, uh, you, you mentioned specific resources like SQL Server, maybe for local environments, uh, you know, if, again, thinking in like a .NET world, you're using IIS Express and local DB. But in your production environment, you're using uh, IIS or SQL Server. Yeah, and I think it's uh, important to draw the distinction there, too, because, uh, you know, if you're working in, like, a Spring Java kind of environment, you're going to have a lot of XML files. But those aren't um, the kind of configs that we're talking about here because those don't change between deployments. You know, those are just kind of wiring your application together. Right. And here we're talking about the kind of settings that need to, to talk to, like, external services and things like that. Yeah, these are literally things like passwords or anything to make connections. And that is an important distinction. But I thought the cool part about it and is something that probably just about every .NET application breaks is you should almost always try to avoid putting them in config files, right? Yeah. Which w- it's so easy to check them in that way. Yeah, and that yeah, that's it, the key. It makes the point to say that like uh, you know storing these configs, you know, this is often stored as like constants Right, either in, in the code or in some kind of config, and it it points this out as like, hey, this is a violation, right? Like you should you should have that configuration data, uh, you know, not it should not be committed into the code base. Right, you should never have to change the code. Your code should be able to run without those constants defined in in the actual code. But they point out you should try and do it in environment variables on the in the particular OS that you're working in. So. In Windows, you have your environment variables. Uh, Linux has places where you can place those things. And and there were two reasons for it, right? One is you can leverage the OS's ability to use those environment variables, and the other was the source code. Like, if you don't have a config file, the chances of you checking it in are zero, right? But it does go on to point out, though, that this doesn't 
include this does not include internal application configuration. So like I think Joe mentioned the Spring. Code. So right. the, you know those you know how the code modules are connected in Spring that doesn't count. Uh, similarly, like you know dependency injection, like if you were using Unity for example, that wouldn't count right. according to this definition. Right. It, it's it's more so your your passwords, your private and your and your keys and stuff that you use to connect to web services, your database connections, like you mentioned a second ago, all those kind of things that would change from environment to environment as far as how you're going to connect your permissions, your credentials, all that kind of stuff. Um, maybe even, you know, how many rows you show on a page, something like that, right? That's the kind of thing that you could set in an environment variable somewhere or what they recommend doing in an environment variable. Um, that's that is what you should be able to do that wouldn't break your application right if you took away a spring config file your whole app crashes right same thing with with unity or maybe any any other type of thing like that so um one thing i thought was really interesting about the environment variables is this uh, notion of they call it orthogonality uh, which is i looked it up it just means right angles <laughs> but what it really means uh, for us is that you can have um different environments even on the same computer so if you wanted to spin up different processes and say have a like a different port number or something like that for each one then that's something that you can easily do in the environment and you don't have to worry about managing these files you know it can just kind of get that data from somewhere and save it for its particular session and then the uh, the good test that somebody actually put in here that's so true is can your can your code be open sourced right now? Basically, could you take your code and upload it to Git and be perfectly safe and sound that you didn't have any passwords in there, that you didn't have anything like that, that, that you would basically just really shoot yourself in the foot? Yeah, I like this question is how fired would you be if your uh, <laughs> application was open sourced right now? Uh, that's awesome. Just a little fired or a lot fired? <laughs> right. Yeah, if you've got credentials in there, then you're definitely fired. Yep. And again, time fired. and again, like we've, we've done something like this in the past, right? Like, so web.config is one of the key things that's used with .NET file or .NET web applications, right? And they kind of get abused and that's where you put a lot of your things like your connection strings and, and all the different types of settings. But, um, at a previous engagement, we had actually worked on something where we took a lot of those variables and stuck them into IIS up on the actual server, right? which would be like its environment variable. So instead of having a web config that you check in, you put that on the server and you're good to go, right? Well, I guess where I was thinking about, or I thought you were going to go with that too, is that uh, specific to .NET environment, right? Like there's the web config or an app config that are specific to that web application or the application. But there's also machine level configs too. And so you could have... um, some configuration, maybe you want to have some credentials that are available system wide. Um, you know, I don't know, I guess as I say that, it sounds bad, but maybe you want to have those credentials system wide and, uh, you could, you could put that stuff into the machine config, which is rarely going to be touched. Right. And, and the beautiful thing is now when you go to deploy your app, you don't have to worry about, you know, munging up your config files before they go into a particular environment, which is a lot of times what happens, right? Like you'll transform a web config or probably even in other languages, you'll you'll have it overwrite keys here and there. If you have something like these environment variables set up, you don't have to worry about that. You just deploy the app and those environment variables are already there. You're not going to overwrite them. They're in a completely separate space. And so your deployments become much less painful. Yeah, another thing about those uh, about the machine config, you know, again, very .NET specific though, is that like you know, at the end of the day, that's just a file, it just happens to live in a system specific you know uh, directory space, but it, it's just a file, so it makes it easy to like move that around. Is is my point that so like going back to the Docker kind of point or Puppet or Chef kind of uh, scenarios, right? It, you know, being that it's just a file makes it a little bit easy to move around. Yep. Yeah, but uh, you do lose the orthogonality, which is also a problem of um, storing your stuff in a database. And also, I was right. kind of wondering, you know, why not the database? But then um, another reason is uh, where do you store your connection string for the database? Right. Yeah, but I also see that as like, that's a very, that seems like a very specific need though, where you would have duplicates of the environment variables that don't, clash with one another but yet 
multiple instances of the same app would know which version of the environment variable to use. Like that, that seems like, I well, don't you know. Can have, you can have your own environment. So like if you're running in your own kind of, um, you know, sub shell or whatever, you can have your own uh, environment settings that get overlaid and are specific to that process. So like imagine if you start up a shell, you start up a, a sub shell inside of that, then you can apply environment var- variables inside that sub shell and it's not going to leak outside Yeah, but is there's also there's still like user configuration specific. I mean, again, we're harping on .NET though. Uh, that that's specific to that user though, right? There would be in the you know, I guess I'm thinking like um, I guess by based on what you said about you know be, it being specific to the user, made me kind of think in like a Linux world, you know, where like um, your Bash profile might load up, you know environment variables environment variables specific to you and mine might load up similar ones but specific to me right and you could do similar things in a windows environment with a with the user configs right so would that not solve that yeah i was just kind of thinking um sometimes with cluster environments like you have to have like a, a unique identifier and if so if you had um you know, a couple different processes running and they were clustered all, you know, although they were all in the same machine which doesn't make a lot of sense then you might, you know, need to have a, a different GUID in each environment that that process is running. That's a totally contrived example, though. Hmm. Yeah, I guess the only thing that that does make it a little disappointing, though, about this is that it, you know, these this configuration is a dependency on your app, but it's now separate from your app. Was yep. the only thing that's like mm, we still have that part. That's not quite solved yet. Does that make sense? Yep. And you have to bring in another tool really to, to manage this because you know you're talking about things being different in multiple you know prod staging whatever. So how do we keep those separate? Do we you know do we check those in the source control? Like how do we keep track of these things? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a little the more. Answer difficult. is not source control, by the way. Uh, also, speaking of this, a really bad practice okay. is naming variables. Well, wouldn't that depend though, like on what you were using? Uh, I, yeah, I guess so. I mean, if I if you're I mean, doing if you're like some sort of puppet, puppet or chef, right? Yeah, then you would want to check that stuff in, right? But then right. you've got the problem of secrets and the GitHub problem again. Yeah. You, okay. You okay. Like, if you're it. speaking specifically to credentials, then yeah, fine. You don't want to check in credentials. I'm with you on that one. Hmm. Yeah, but the, you can chase your tail all day long in the whole uh, you know the key problem. So. Yeah. So one of the other things that they pointed out that is extremely true, you should never name any kind of environment variables or config config variables dev underscore or staging underscore or prod underscore. They should be consistent because once you start going down that road, your app has to handle these things. And so now it's looking at different types of variable names that may or may not exist in different places. So so never prefix your environment variables or your config variables with environment level information. Yep. Oh, yeah, we uh, didn't. right. Yeah. Just don't prepend it with any kind of. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Don't prepend it with dev, test, or prod. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you guys think of the importance rating for this one? Hmm. Um, I kind of cheated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm reading it. I. I don't know. I think this one might could be a little bit higher because I'm definitely not a fan of accidentally checking in passwords to source control. Yeah, I'm a little bit higher on this one. I would call myself like a a high minus on this one. Because they, they, they listed it as medium. And I don't know. They just It feels a little short. So, Yeah. I mean, definitely... So from a security point of view, I don't like the credentials leaking in. Other things, I can I can see why it becomes why they rated it as a medium though. Like if you take everything credential, you know, talk out of consideration, and we're talking about other things, then you can kind of make kind of like eh, okay, fine, I see where you're coming at with medium. Yeah, but I feel like how many times have you seen a problem where something got deployed and. Uh, a setting was lost or forgotten to be at, you know, a new setting was not added and it caused a, you know, a big outage. Like that happens all the time. Yeah. It really so does. I, I kind of think of this as being a part of that solution. Well, mm, 
Yeah, I guess that makes me question then, like, are we talking about a configuration that's internal to the application? Right? Because remember, those type of configuration things are part of the code base and are checked in. No, we're we're definitely talking about, you know, I, I don't know, it, it, throw away password, you know, something that says how many records are supposed to show on your page or, or something like that, right? Like that gets left out and all of a sudden your app needs it and it breaks. Right. And it's because this stuff isn't checked into source control. It, it's not automatically deployed, right? So let's say you're adding a new caching, you're, you're adding a memcache, um, you know, functionality to your website. Then when I'm you going back. This, I want to revise my answer because as I go back and I look at this again, because I had said taking out everything credential wise, but really, you know, this is talking about everything that's likely to vary. Right. Right. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to support the high. Well, that came out wrong. <laughs> Twice in one episode. You heard it here. <laughs> I'm not even trying. Uh, all right. So that's actually, we've I gone think through. I need to move to Colorado or something. <laughs> here I come, Washington. Uh, so we've made it through the first three chapters, or I guess you could call them chapters, of the 12-factor app. Yeah, chapters. Factors. Tw- or, yeah, 12 factors. Yes. The 12-factor chapters. We've gone through the first three factors of the 12-factor <laughs> app. All right. So, um, yeah, we, I mean, this, this could go on for, for quite a while. So we're going to cut it off here and we're going to go ahead and talk about some of the resources we like. Yep. Um, so first is the actual, um, there's a nice article on Heroku.com, uh, talking about this, but, uh, even more importantly than that, they actually created a website called 12 factor.net that, um, actually goes through and has like a nice write up on each of the factors chapters. And that's the number 12 factor.net yep. for the URL. It's important to note that the name that they actually use elsewhere, 12 is spelled out, but for the URL, it's the number. Yep. And uh, that article that we mentioned that talked about uh, each item and kind of uh, assigned the rating, um, that's on clearlytech.com. We'll have a link to that as well. Yep. And we've also got links to Wikipedia for the declarative and imperative, and also to the Microsoft article about um, deploying with dependencies and all that kind of stuff. So we got several in here. And then, yeah, so with that, let's get into the, uh, Alan's favorite section of the show, <laughs> the tip of the week. Yes. Th- this week. <laughs> it's the week. <laughs> it is the week. This is a week uh, that we are recording and it's the tip of that particular week. Yes. I love this part. All right. So, uh, we've talked about plural site before and lynda.com has come up as well. And there was one that I think is relatively new. Um, I could be wrong on that, but it was new to me. Like I, I found it, you know, a few months ago and I've been meaning to bring it up and kept forgetting and, uh, finally remembered to bring it up. And that is code school.com, which has been, uh, acquired by plural site. But, uh, one of the cool things that I liked about this, though, is that you know, like the like like Plural Site, for example, you know, you you get there's some video to teach you whatever the subject is that you're trying to teach, um, but like Plural Site, for example, we've joked about the you know if you pay for like one of the upper level subscriptions, there are these tests that you can take after the fact, right? And um, you know, it's like eh, whatever, who cares, right? But with CodeSchool.com, there are these coding challenges that are like right after you finish a section. And it's in line to the whole presentation, right? Like it's not, it doesn't feel disconnected um, like, uh, like well, speaking specifically about plural sites, right? Like it, it's, it's, it's part of the whole thing. Like you have, you have to do that before you move on to the next thing. And yeah, you could skip it or if you really wanted to, but... Yeah, you know, the whole idea is it, it's trying to uh, uh, you know, strengthen, yeah, you know, enhance or, or you know, strengthen whatever you know they were trying to, whatever the subject is that they were trying to teach you, right? So it was it was really nice, and it's a very well done interface for those coding challenges too. Um, you know, where it'll give you some, you know, hey, make make this uh, like if it's an Angular thing, right? It's like, uh, you know, hey, make this directive do this, and you know. 
uh, you'll go and do it. And if you're if you start doing it wrong, like there'll be little things that'll pop up. Be like, nah, it's not quite what we meant, right? Sometimes it can get a little crazy. You know, if if you didn't do it exactly, you know, um, you know, character for character, what they wanted to see. But uh, yeah, it, it it's quite the nice uh, resource. So if you've never tried it, you can go on there, and there's courses that you can see for free. To, you know, with, but of course there are. Uh, subscription based pricing too but i thought i'd throw that one out there since we have talked about other learning resources so that's another one that you can put in the uh the toolbox central florida represent <laughs> <laughs> i actually have a, a shirt um that they they did a, a thing a while back called rails for zombies where you would kind of like f- fight and escape the zombies by programming stuff in ruby it was just a nice um it's really unique course that they did okay so i did not realize that they are from uh, Orlando, Florida. So I'm going to take my tip of the week back. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's that's all that we have. <laughs> you have Disney. Come on, yeah. man. <laughs> you know it's funny. Um, like everyone that I've met around here, like, what do you do? Like, oh, programmer, work from home. They're like, oh, have you heard of Code School and, and Envy Labs? I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, I have. It's all we have. But then you should say, have you heard of Coding Blocks? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> if only we had some shirts or hats or something. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right, so I um, I asked for help um, coming up with a tip this week, and uh, I did get one. I kind of messed up the tweet, but anyway, break up with IE8. We kind of mentioned it last time, so I'm not going to use that tip, but uh, Carl, you're right. IE8 is terrible. It needs to go. Um, the tip I was going to use is uh, programming your hands. It's an old article from another one of my idols, uh, Jeff Atwood, for um, little exercises that uh, you can do to kind of help with carpal tunnel type syndrome. Um, or symptoms, and that that's something that affects a lot of people that I know, including myself. So, check it out. This is interesting. This, so this article is almost hand exercises is what he's trying to say. It, this thing's almost ten years old. This can't be true anymore. <laughs> yeah, everything I know, unfortunately, is uh, like ten years old. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it definitely says something about you. Whenever time, every time you read an article, something like, "Hey, that reminds me of something I read ten years ago." You know, you know that it's a, a sign of how old the article is when, as you scroll down to the bottom, and there's links for like the next or the, you know, the for the previous article or the next article, and the title of the article is something like, "Did IE6 make Web 2.0 possible?" Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> wow. It that, is. It, yeah. That that's scary. <laughs> Wait. So does this mean that I'm old, or that everything is coming around again? Hmm. Or, or maybe you're just discovering the internet, so like you're going through uh, archive.org. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're starting from the beginning. So you, you've made your way through the 90s, and now you're in the mid-2000s. Very nice. You'll catch up soon. All right. <laughs> I'm surprised last week you weren't telling us about Y2K. <laughs> I was thinking about it. Uh, all right, so my <laughs> tip of the week. This one's kind of yeah. interesting. I, it's called Packery, and it's packery.metaphysy.co. And really all it is, it's pretty nifty. If you go to the page and you resize the page, you'll actually see what it's doing. So if you have a bunch of containers or divs or something, and this is for the web, by the way, this is a JavaScript library that will lay out items that you have in a way that that takes up space in an appropriate way. Oh, it'll Pinterest your stuff. Yeah, kind of. Except in all kinds of layouts, like, you know, Pinterest has its own, you know, two column type deal or whatever. This, you can actually tell it to be really meticulous or give it a building block type thing or kind of lay it out sort of randomly. But it's pretty amazing that it will just literally lay out your content in all these nifty little formats and, and, and format it properly for you. So, and and I think it's relatively cheap. Um, uh, Where's the price? I, I can't remember, but it, it's... Well, is there a price for it? It's on GitHub. It's on GitHub. If you want to use it commercially... Okay, so a developer license is $25. Like, it's dirt cheap if you want to use it for commercial purposes. If you For just, one developer. Yeah, for one developer. If you're wanting to put it in, like, you know, some sort of blog or something, you can probably get the free version and play with it. But it's, it's pretty nifty. I, I definitely recommend going up there and just resizing your browser and seeing what oh. it does with those blocks at the top. It's It's pretty cool. Hold on, wait a minute. It was uh, now that's old news. That that JavaScript framework has been deprecated. <laughs> There's now packet.js. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, There's no stop such it. thing. Hey, well, there might be a such thing. Hey, Who knows? Actually, another cool thing is if you're up there, click on some of those blocks 
and you'll see them resizing and kind of reshaping everything as you go. Like it, it's pretty pretty neat stuff, man. So uh, you know, it seems like the most annoying layout though. Like everything's like you know, as you're clicking on, it's like, oh my god, I was just reading this other article and I was looking at this uh, the next article I wanted to click on and it just moved. Where'd it go? Yeah, I'm gonna make a copy of Flipboard and I'm gonna call it Blockboard, and I'm <laughs> going to use this. <laughs> Yeah, how can you close source JavaScript? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, seriously. Well, they did um, the the closest best thing, which is uh, GPL v three. So, uh, yeah, yeah. if you're going to use their stuff without paying them, then you are also going to be publishing your stuff open source. Yeah. So, good luck to everybody who decides to do that. So, how fired would you be if you didn't pay for this <laughs> license and you included it in your code base? Yeah, go ahead and pony up. What was it for eight developers? It was like 110 or 115 bucks. Yeah, go yeah. ahead and do that so you don't give away your code. So that is pretty much it. That's the first three parts of the 12 factor app. So, yeah. And we definitely want to hear about that, um, dependency isolation tool. So let us know. Oh yeah. We totally forgot about like another, this is a second, second time we've forgotten about a, uh, a survey. Dang. Oh, we didn't even talk about the survey results from last time. No, we didn't. Not. Oh, fail. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we'll be picking it back up on the next one. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to like uh I guess I guess uh you know, Alan said that he was right, so maybe we should say like, you know, well maybe the question should be, Well, was he? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, we'll have some sort of poll, so go to the website and uh, we'll have something there that's super awesome for you to see. Yeah, you know, was Alan right or was Michael right? <laughs> I feel like all your polls uh, have that kind of angle. <laughs> and 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 don't don't uh if if you haven't already watched the Apple keynote, don't don't listen to any Apple news and then you know just go and like blindly decide like is Michael right or is Alan right. I think that should be it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't even put the question of what we were right about in there, right? Just Yeah, no, 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 no. Who was no. right? <laughs> yeah. Uh all right. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Uh, so, like we said, uh, you know, if, if you're hearing this on a friend's uh, device, be sure to find us on iTunes, Stitcher, or more. Use your favorite podcast app and subscribe to us there. And uh, like uh, like I've already said before, if you haven't already left us a review, we would greatly appreciate it and be forever grateful. Uh, if you would go to either iTunes or Stitcher, again, you can go to codingblocks.net slash review to find uh, quick links to those resources. Or if you have a preferred podcast aggregator where you'd like to leave a review, please do. And, hey, let us know what that is so that we can be aware of it too. Yep, and contact us with any question, topic, leave your name, preferred method of shout-out, and we'll mention you on the podcast. And visit us at www.cuttingblocks.net where you can find all our show notes, examples, discussions, and more. And this particular episode will be cuttingblocks.net slash episode 32. Yep, and if you don't want to tweet us, you can send us an email to comments at codingblocks.net and uh, let us know about that isolation tool or uh, how wrong we are about any of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, that Twitter address, uh, at codingblocks. Yep. All right.